Good morning, everyone. I am Michael Brown, and this is the 2016 State of the College Address. We want to welcome everyone who is here with us at the Montgomery College uh, Center for Cultural Arts, and we also want to say hello to everyone and welcome you, those of you who are watching us online. Now, before I turn things over to Dr. Pollard, I do want to mention that we are going to have questions at the conclusion of Dr. Pollard's address. If you're watching online, you can email those questions to State of the College at MontgomeryCollege.edu, or you can tweet them to at MontgomeryCall using the hashtag SOTC2016. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the president of, Dr. of Montgomery College, Dr. Darian Pollard. Thank you, Mike. I, I will let you know that I have been told that I'm not the president at home. So I'm very glad that I get to be the president here at Montgomery College. And thank you, each of you, for choosing to be here today. I'm very hopeful that there'll be some comments that resonate with you. I'd like to do a special uh, thank you uh, to at least three, and I think another is on his way, members of our Board of Trustees. Uh, your support and guidance are just tremendous to me, and uh, I'm just delighted that you would choose to be here. So thank you, uh, Mr. Bob Levy, Mr. Mike Pretty, and our Board Chair, Ms. Marsha Select smith uh, Thank you all for choosing to be here, and I believe uh, that Dr. Les Levine will be joining us as well. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a very popular pastime, if you don't mind, spending money. Uh, I can think uh, it's safe to say that we all enjoy spending money. Uh, deciding on how it is to be spent, though, can be fairly complicated from time to time. It's the number one thing that young couples fight about. It's the number one thing that older people worry about. And it's oftentimes the number one thing that college presidents talk about when we get together. How much is your tuition? What is your capital budget this year? What's your fund balance going to be? How much financial aid are your students qualifying for? We're obsessed with it for lots of different reasons, but oftentimes for all of the right reasons. Because if you're leading an institution effectively, spending is tightly connected to student success. Spending wisely allows us to create programs that respond to students' unique needs. Our ACES program, which reaches into 10 Montgomery County public high schools to help students start strong, now boasts a 91% retention rate. Funding also allows us to create programs like Achieving the Promise Academy, which is in its very first year is supporting students towards completion. Smarter funding allows us to help students transfer select us successfully like our engineering transfer program, which boasts an 80% transfer rate to four-year institutions. Now, even though I was an English major, Dr. Rye, um, I think a lot about numbers. Not surprised by that, I hope. In some ways, leading a college is quite a bit like leading a business. I have to keep track of how much every initiative costs and whether it, the outcomes make it worth the investment that we've made as an institution. I have to take inventories oftentimes, just like businesses. And I spend a lot of time talking with my administrative team about their budgets, talking with the county and the state about our funding and the needs of the institution, and talking to business owners in the community about how we might partner with them on joint ventures to benefit the community that we serve. So what does this mean, and does this mean, that Montgomery College is a business? Yes and no. So let me start off by saying that I understand why some of you balk at calling Montgomery College a business. Many of us chose to go into education because we didn't want to go into business. In fact, we didn't want to make our lives about profits and losses and margins and quarterly earnings. We wanted it to be about knowledge and discovery. We wanted to be have opportunities to cultivate students' minds and to help them grow and inspire them to be the best that they could be in their lives. And I hope that's why all of you are here, those of you in this room and those who are watching us virtually, because I can tell you for sure that is why I choose to be here, 
If you haven't heard me say it before, I believe deeply in the transformative nature of higher education and the power of what it can do. I've lived it and I've seen it happen over and over and over again in the lives of students. At the same time though, I have enough experience to know that our mission as a community college will not survive unless the college thinks more like a business. There was a time in, this hist in the history of our country when higher education was primarily privately funded. If you were not an aristocratic white male, you didn't have access to higher education and you couldn't afford to attend it. Today though, at Montgomery College, 72% of our students are non-white, 53% are female, and 30% receive Pell Grants. Since we are reliant on county and state dollars and funding for most of our budget, we're also subject to the rise and the fall of the issues of the market and the pressures on local and national economies. And since we're committed to keeping tuition affordable, we also are limited in how much we can expand that particular source of revenue. These positions, these issues, uh, pose a little bit of a quandary for us as an institution from time to time. We're deeply altruistic and committed to student success, but we face very real world limits on our spending. Now here's a good example of this. In our planning for next year's budget, we've asked the County Council for $10 million of additional dollars over last year's funding. And the County Executive has committed $2 million thus far. And the budgeting process is far from over, as a few of us know, but the college is continuing to work with the county and the state. But let's think about this for a moment. The money that we've requested of that $10 million, $7.5 million were for increases in compensation and benefits. The cost of living goes up in our county, so our employees need to be able to match that and have resources to support them and their families. That brings me back to the business model. The only way that Montgomery College can continue to fulfill its mission is by thinking like a business. We have to take funding into account when we make instructional and programmatic decisions. And every day, every moment, we have to be asking very serious questions, such as, do we have the money to make classes smaller? Do we have the money and can we afford the technologies that will prepare our students more thoroughly? Can we spend more money on scholarships for students who can't afford our tuition? Is the college a business because it asks these questions? This is where the business model doesn't quite fit in sometimes. If the college is a business, then our product is education, but we're not selling it for profit. In fact, We've raised millions of dollars in scholarship to help students who need education in order to reach their goals. We spend a lot of energy and time persuading the government to help pay for our product and to allow people to come to our institution. And we have an entire division of the institution, Advancement and Community Engagement, that connects us with partners who can help us make our product affordable and accessible to members of our community. So we don't always follow the unwritten rules of traditional business. So if calling the college a business violates your personal sense of mission or higher calling for what we do as an institution, then try thinking about it another way. As an institution, we must embrace business strategies to advance our mission and to preserve it we have to be more fiscally prudent as an institution, more so than we've ever been. We need to be more strategic about what we have been doing. So what you call this mindset is less important to me than whether you adopt it. In the end, our creditors are gonna still send the same bills. They're gonna ask us to pay for our technology costs. They're gonna ask us to pay for our maintenance contracts and we're still going to have employee salaries 
no matter what term we choose to call this art and business that we're in. And the risk of not adopting these business strategies, though, will be borne by our students. If we're not responsive to fiscal realities of our institution, our students will, get, will not get the education or the training that they need for the jobs that allow them to be competitive in the skilled workforce of today. We must adopt new strategic approaches for spending for student success. Now, I have to tell you, we're not the only community college in the country that's grappling with us. I know sometimes we think ourselves a little special, and we are. But this is an issue that's being dealt with across the country. In fact, it is an exception to find a community college that is not altering its practices in response to fiscal demands. Now, I want to share with you some snapshots of community colleges across the country in which we have uh, some unique relationships with to see how they have strategically approached the same challenges that we're facing because I think it's very useful to have context when we do this work. Lorain County Community College near Cleveland, Ohio has faced many of the same spending limitations that we have, but it has ambitiously engaged its faculty and its staff who identified a total of $2 million in savings to advance their budget. What has impressed me the most, though, about Lorraine is how it has successfully engaged its campus community as it has come together to implement its savings plan. Looking at the Lorraine model has helped me to think a lot differently and better about and appreciate big data analytics and to find patterns that can help save cost. I'll let Lorraine tell you a little bit about its story, and on the other side, we'll talk a little bit about that. We, like other higher education institutions, found ourselves in a position of a lower investment from our state um, due to the economy, as well as students who had come back to Lorain County Community College during the recession, um, but now we're re-entering the job market. So we had lower number of students taking fewer courses, so lower source of tuition, as well as state share of instruction. And this kind of um, best of all worlds in terms of the perfect storm tsunami um, led us to, to think about our work differently. And we knew that in that process, given those, those financial conditions, we needed to shave $2 million from our budget. We engaged over 175 different faculty and staff members, as well as students in the process. And that generated over 300 different unique ideas towards that goal. We identified 20 action items that we put into implementation. And I'm proud to say that we successfully met that $2 million goal. 75%, uh, roughly $1.5 million, we were able to achieve through transformational efforts and initiatives that were focused on improving student success but at the same time, reducing costs from an academic affairs perspective. And some of the types of things that we did, um, one of our major uh, programs was called an, an academic diet. And the idea behind this was how could we look at our most frequently enrolled in courses, think differently about improving student completion rates in those courses, do we create greater class sizes? Do we embed tutoring? Do we also look at supplemental instruction as a part of that? Um, given that our state has moved to 100% performance funding based, rethinking our business model in terms of the return on investment for student success and completion was a major component of the academic diet. We also looked at actually reducing the class schedule of offerings so that we were more thoughtful with regard to which courses were offered and why. Uh, we were able to implement a half a million dollars in savings because of the reduction in the class schedule itself um, by looking at alternative approaches to delivery. We also employed big data analytics so that we could be much more prescriptive about 
what programs the students were in, which courses needed to be taken, and when we needed to offer them. So those are some of the ways in which we created collaboration, used an evidence-based approach, and then really relied on the campus community to develop plans for implementation. And as a result, we were able to reduce our costs and expenditures and create efficiencies um, that that saved essentially more than $2 million for, uh, from the college's budget. So you may have heard Lorraine's leadership mention a campus committee that looked at all the possible saving plans within the institution. They came up with 20 action items that they implemented, resulting in $2 million in savings into their budget. Uh, as a result of this and my knowledge about how colleges work, uh, I'm forming a similar work group here for Montgomery College, and I'm going to call it my infamous name, our Blue Ribbon Task Force on Spending for Success. This group will look at whether we're using our resources in ways that best serve students. For example, a question that we have to ask ourselves, 90% of Montgomery College students are enrolled in 20 of our nearly 130 programs of study. We probably need to look critically as an institution at whether this is the best use of our resources as an institution. If a particular program is not successfully graduating a significant number of students and is more expensive to run than other programs, we're probably going to need to address some issues of efficiency in those programs. This is where data analytics can be useful. We can easily analyze programs on a variety of indicators such as cost, enrollment, completion, and in some cases, pass rates on industry-related certifications. These assessments will help us make more informed decisions about our spending for student success. We will have to increase everyone's success data and access to that in order to grow our collective understanding about what is working well within the institution and what can be done to improve it across the organization. But I can assure you that the process will contribute to student success. I will also be asking this task force to look at scaling up successful programs. We have a number of pilot efforts across the institution that have some very promising outcomes thus far and that they should be expanded. This task force will also take a closer look at the cost of scaling up these effective programs. And by the way, you may have noticed that Lorraine uh, works from a performance-based funding model in the state of Ohio. You may have caught that 100% uh, performance-based funding. For those of you who don't know this term, at Ohio, in Ohio, colleges uh, are funded, is tied directly to their performance outcomes such as completion or retention and persistence. And although no one in Maryland is currently talking about this issue, and I say currently because last year they were, uh, some 27 states have tried performance-based funding across this country, so we're not immune to it, and I bet the conversation will come up again very soon. I am glad that the college has been so diligent as establishing our own scorecard, and I'll come back to that a little bit later in the conversation today, so that our stakeholders can easily see what we're doing and how our progress can be measured through data. It is clear, consistent way of tracking data has an impact. We can easily see the investments we make in students and if they are creating the results that we want to see. If we're ever held to a performance-based model, we are ahead of the game as an institution. Our Spending for Success Task Force is also going to be looking at efficiencies. Realigning our common work processes can be an area of significant savings. We did this successfully through our academic realignment, and I know that that model can be re-examined and expanded. There are places in the college where there are parallel processes operating unnecessarily. This is where technology is going to play a significant and bigger role in efficiency. So I mentioned a few general categories that this task force will likely consider. Course management and scheduling, expansion or reduction of academic programs, and administrative processes 
clarification. But these are just the things to get started. There are many more areas where efficiencies can be increased. And as an institution, the college has not been very disciplined, I guess is the best way to say, about identifying potential efficiencies. That's why this task force will be charged with considering proposals from anyone on any campus. Faculty, staff, students, administrators at the college are often in the best positions to see how things get done well or not so well. And I believe that many of you here today in the room and those of you who are viewing could come up with insights about the college's spending. And with the right coaching to analyze the data and the finances behind it, I believe that we could help us all work more efficiently as an organization. Now there are two challenges though for this type of campaign. One is raising everyone's fiscal IQ about how the college's budget works. And I know that not everybody understands the entire budgeting process. It is a complicated one. Uh, the difference between operating and capital budgets, uh, for example, or the back and forth that we have, the dance, as I like to call it, with the county and with the state. Um, I didn't know these processes either until I moved into roles where I were held responsible for them. But we're smart people at this college, very smart. Um, and I want to provide you with opportunities to educate yourself about this. So here are a few basics. Where does the college get money? As you can see, the college, uh, uh, the county provides the largest component of our funding, over half. And we are extremely grateful to the county for its generosity. In fact, the county has increased its contributions over the last few years to make up for gaps left by the state. We are very fortunate to be in Montgomery County. Tuition is our second largest source of revenue, which we try to hold down for the sake of students and their accessibility. But it still makes up about 32% of our revenue budget for the institution. And finally, state aid is about 13% which is less than what the state's Cade funding formula recommended. Maryland's policy for funding commitments to community colleges was designed around an idea of one-third from the county, one-third from the state, and one-third from students, which, as you can see, is not what we have right now in the present day. This puts us as an institution in a very vulnerable position. Let me be very clear about that. As I said, the county has been extremely generous to us as a college. And the county has been very forward thinking about the college's role in building a skilled workforce. And despite our strong partnership with the county, there are financial stressors all over which the county has very little control, over which we have very little control, and is subjected to fluctuations in the market as well as politics. So there may be a time when our county is not just in a strong enough position to support all of the work that we want to do as an institution for our community. This is one of the reasons we need to spend smarter. What does the college spend money on? The other side of the equation is where we spend our money. As you can see here, 81% of our spending goes to salaries and benefits. It is by far the college's largest expense as is the case with most colleges and universities in this country. Contracted services is a distant second, followed by supplies, communications, conferences, et cetera. I'm showing you these data because I want you to notice two things. First, our most important asset is our people. And this is the line that we talk tremendously about when we're advocating for this institution. An expert in higher ed fundraising, James Frick at the University of Notre Dame, once wrote, quote, don't tell me where your priorities are. Show me where you spend your money, and I'll tell you what they are. Our priorities are obviously with our students, since we invest so much in our faculty and our staff. This says a lot about the talent and commitment at this institution that such a large portion of our budget goes toward personnel. At the same time, though, because personnel costs are largely fixed for a given year, 
we have to look much more closely and carefully at the places where we can spend money more wisely, such as contracted services and efficiencies. As we think about this process, it's helpful to me to keep going back to the question, are we spending for student success? Maybe we need bracelets, you know those bracelets? I think we need to have that. Are we spending for student success? When we tie our outcomes to this question, I think we can more clearly think about where we might need to create some new efficiencies and work processes or apply our limited resources in different ways. Now this is a very mini college uh, budget primer right here, but you may have more insights on how your department or division might spend smarter. The college's office of management and budget would be happy to come and spend time and look at your budget with you and your division or department to give you some analytical tools to think more deeply about how to search for efficiencies. And I want to encourage you to ask questions. We are an academic institution. We're supposed to be a community of intellectuals. Ask questions. Find out how the finances stack up in your dis discipline or area so that you can more deeply and clearly understand where savings might occur. And ke please keep in mind that we're talking about efficiencies and work processes. The big picture. We're not talking about trimming the coffee budget, right? And that, that, we can spend a lot of time talking about the little stuff. We're talking about the big things that can have systemic impact within the organization. We're looking for ideas that have a multiplier effect. I said this first challenge was understanding the budget. The second challenge is spending smarter, but without sacrificing student retention and completion. We need to spend smarter while also increasing our impact on students. Now this may seem like a tall order for a lot of us to think about, but we have many of the tools to accomplish this. Technology is a powerful, powerful partner and mechanism for efficiency. Data analytics can give us more insights. External grants can add uh, resources that will propel our students more. We're not talking about starting from ground zero. We're building on efforts that have taken place within this institution for several years. And I assure you, this will be a productive experience for us as a college. I can guarantee you that if you participate in this process, you will understand more about the college's budget and our strengths and our weaknesses. You will be in a better position to make contributions, to dialogue about the college's future, and you will learn financial literacy skills that will give you insights about the world far beyond Montgomery College. To give you an example of how this process can work, I want to introduce you to a community college in Flint, Michigan. You've heard quite a bit about Flint in the news of late, recently because of the uh, dangerous lead levels discovered in its water supply. Before that crisis, Flint was reeling from the loss of General Motors and 75,000 jobs, which had been, uh, been the industrial center of the city for decades. You also know we have a special relationship with Mott, as they are a sister college, and our own Dr. Beverly Walker Grafia uh, went there to become its president. So she walked into an organization that had to be very creative to keep itself afloat. And despite these challenges, the faculty and staff at Mott have taken the reins and made proactive decisions about where to use their resources. Let's take a look. Mott Community College, Flint and Genesee County, Michigan. Ranked nationally. Five sites, two workforce development centers. The region's economic driver. General Motors and Flint, a one industry boom town. Great jobs, great schools, great neighborhoods. Losing GM and Flint's American dream. Economic decline, unemployment, poverty, crime, blight, and population loss. A poisoned water supply. The impact on Mott. Property values down. State appropriations down. Enrollment down. Tuition increasing. Tuition revenue now accounts for the greatest share of our funding. 2010 to 2014. Implemented excellent course section management practices. 
hired part-time faculty only when absolutely necessary, used more contract and temporary employees, balanced the budget by reducing maintenance and equipment replacement funding by 83%, depleting 20% of general fund balance, using $1.2 million of reserves. 2014 to 2016, previous strategies were no longer sustainable. Mott implemented new reforms. Reform number one, a new staffing review process. Stopped overspending on federal work-study funding by $775,000 over three years. Held student workers to no more than 19 hours a week. Stopped using temporary and part-time workers beyond contracted hours. Reduced overtime use. Established a new review and analyze process for filling vacancies or creating new positions. Reform number two, increasing employees' budget literacy. The goals, budget-savvy college employees, financial transparency, encouraging employees to ask questions and offer solutions. Established a new all-college budget advisory committee recommending budgetary strategies and priorities. A meaningful financial dashboard created with college-wide input and housed on the college's website budget performance discussions at each all-college meeting, union leadership engaged with budgetary decisions or changes, a new We Are One employee giving campaign charting our own preferred future, new strategies, a reform mindset, a determined college. So I hope that you noticed that Mott also emphasized budget literacy for his faculty and staff. It also is using a course management system and has created what they have called a budget advisory committee, similar to that that you saw at Lorraine. Additionally, Mott created a new level of transparency for his budgets, which I think we need to move toward here at Montgomery College. If we're going to be equally invested and student success, we should have access to the same information on the spending behind the common goal. I know this may upset some power dynamics in a few departments and some offices, but I believe it is worth it for the larger good of the institution. Now, you also may have heard that Mott uh, engaged in a new review process for filling vacancies or creating new positions. As you've seen, employee compensation and benefits account for more than 80% of our expenses as an institution. So this is an area that must be mined for potential savings. Additionally, if an employee retires or leaves and our work processes have been realigned somewhat and there are new technologies in place, there are cases in which not refilling a position would save resources for the institution. And I'm not saying that this will always be the case, I'm not saying that there's going to be a rule that says it's going to happen, but we should probably get out of the habit of assuming that every position will be refilled upon an employee's departure from the institution. Every time that happens, we must critically look at those positions and figure out how we can best serve and advance the college's mission of student success. Now obviously these considerations have to be done strategically and carefully, which is why I have decided to convene this task force to help contribute to that discussion. We're not just looking to reduce spending, we're looking for increased efficiencies as an organization and that can affect student success positively. It's a delicate balance I realize and it's something that we have to get our head around in a very uh, thoughtful way. But I also know it's something that can create anxiety as we think about how this will look at the college. And that's why I am encouraging people to participate in the process. Reminds me of my friends who tell me they hadn't voted and after I give them the business and they want to talk about politics, I say you have abdicated your, your right to say anything for the next four years if you didn't vote. So it's kind of the same thing. You need to participate in the process if you want to be able to offer critical insight about the institution's fiscal realities. And by the way, some of you may remember the budget suggestion box, right? That was, that was set up before I got here, and I, I remember interviewing 
for the job and I was doing research in the college and I came across the budget suggestion box, um, we would not be doing that. <laughs> uh, that format uh, cannot happen. Uh, anonymous suggestions will not be reviewed. Um, I don't think it brings out the best in us. Actually, I know that we're better than some of the things I saw in that budget review process. We're all adults, and we can stand by our ideas. And we may have to have dialogue to help us unpack them and understand what's really happening and to be informed about the decisions that we're making. But I think transparency will increase participation and collaboration in this process. And if you still don't see yourself coming up with the idea about how we can save and a proposal to do that, let me suggest another way in which you might participate as an, as an individual. Everyone in this room and who's viewing us virtually can take a closer look at his or, her, his or her own work and ask this question. How could my work contribute even more to student success in 2016? You know the intricacies of your responsibilities better than anyone else at the college. So you are in a unique position to ask the question of yourself, here's where efficiencies could be increased. Have I looked at that? If you're not sure, talk with your supervisor about it. What training can I get to make my work more efficient and more relevant? Are there ways that I can enhance my skills that will make my work more efficient within the organization? And I'm asking you to look at your own work, and to be clear, I look at mine each and every day and ask that same question, because we all play a vital role in student success and the accomplishments of the college. How efficiently I work, for example, impacts the efficiency of each of my colleagues' works as well. There are new technologies, new communication modes, new pedagogies every year. Institutions that keep on top of these changes and are consistent about adopting them across the board will be the colleges that survive. Higher education in the 21st century is rapidly evolving. And to keep pace with that, we have to be intentional about our approach to work. Students also face considerable pressures to get their degree faster and to save money when they do that and to do it at lower cost. So we are a part of a bigger ecosystem that is demanding more from higher education than we have to be, and we have to be set up for that challenge in order for it to be successful. And for those of you who are wondering if perhaps you're one of the few who cannot adapt to new technologies, consider this. If you've had to learn how to use a smartphone or an iPad in the last few years, or you had to learn Uber, then you have built skills that you didn't have a few years ago, right? right? You are probably capable of far more change and transformation than you thought even possible. Technology is an area at the college in which greater efficiencies will have to be realized. We need to put more of our data in the cloud because it is both less expensive and more reliable than maintaining all of our own servers here at the college. But we also have to look at where technology can do more work more quickly and sometimes more accurately than people. There are spaces in which technology can free people up to do the work of student success that only people can do. I recently read an article by Joshua Kim, the director of digital learning initiatives at the Dartmouth Center for Advancement and Learning, who wrote, quote, we need to continue to invest in technology because most of all higher ed needs to understand that education is fundamentally a relational process. We need to put that educator-learner relationship at the center of all of our efforts and then figure out how technology can support that strategy. This is how I envision the role of technology and our smart, smarter spending model. Student success demands fundamentally on the relationships between people, students and advisors, students and faculty, students and staff. And since our budget constraints will not allow us 
to add more people in the foreseeable future, we need to use the time and energy of these people that we do have to do the most important work of the institution. I can guarantee you that a well-designed technology system can improve efficiencies and will be a part of our landscape in the not so distant future. That may mean changes in our business processes and how we work for many of us, but it also means that we will have to stay focused on our mission of student success and then the change itself will become secondary. I'm going to share one more perspective from another college engaged in budgetary reflections. Mohawk Valley Community College in Utica, New York. I hope you'll see how Mohawk's changes parallel several of our own and how others might be useful in this process. I want to draw your attention to Mohawk's use of grant fund, funding as an increased source of revenue. I think this is an area where Montgomery College has a lot of growth potential based on what we do here. Please see the clip. At Mohawk Valley Community College, our stark reality is that after 31% enrollment growth over five years, enrollment has declined 19% in three years. Our local economy has seen improvements and our demographics work against us as we have a shrinking population of high school graduates that lowers our tuition and state aid revenues. Three years ago, as these constraints loomed, my cabinet and I read a series of books to develop shared mental models together. Jim Collins was one of the authors we read, and we came to rely on his research about successful organizations. Some key concepts that have tethered us include confront the brutal facts, preserve the core and stimulate progress, and plan to be together for a long march. The brutal facts are we need to do more with less than we are. For example, we were able to contain rising costs by changing health care brokers, and we offered early retirement incentives, which saved MVCC more than $300,000 per year in four of the last six years. MVCC also made the difficult decision to close our child care center, eliminating a $200,000 annual operating loss. As we move MVCC forward in new ways, we are becoming more strategic in our approach. Our grants team has grown revenue from $800,000 to more than $5 million in four years. Some of these grant opportunities promise to transform the educational opportunities we provide to our students. For example, we leveraged our sponsor county support for achieving the dream into MVCC's first successful application for a Title III grant, and we're aligning that with a community schools grant to provide wraparound services to populations in need. Altogether, these multi-million dollar investments can't happen in a vacuum. Title III never could have happened if we had not already started the hard work of becoming an institution rich with data and inquiry. And aligning these projects makes it possible for us to multiply their positive effects for our students. We are pushing hard for more college-wide engagement in enrollment, not just in admissions. We have made great progress, but we still have a long way to go in terms of building greater efficiency through administrative collaboration and communication. Together, we remain committed to a growth mindset. The Cabinet, as a team, is great at finding areas where the college has abundance and potential. I'm so proud of the Cabinet in the way that we're able to identify solutions and do more of what works to help the college thrive in these uncertain times. Now President Randy uh, Van Wagner talks about the important work that his cabinet is doing, but I know by talking firsthand uh, with many people in his college community who work at the ground level of the organization that his leadership team has been pivotal in giving everyone and Mohawk Valley the tools needed to contribute to the broader fiscal realities. And I'm going to demand that same leadership from our leadership here, team here at the college and to do the same thing. I'm gonna ask them to help everyone at the college raise their fiscal IQ. I'm going to ask them to be transparent about budgeting and spending. And I'm gonna ask everyone to answer some tough questions about their division spending. 
I'm going to ask them to show how they're spending for student success. And I'm going to ask one that everyone in this audience here and virtually can help me by asking the same questions too. The more savvy that we all are collectively about the efficiencies in our work processes, the more likely it is that we'll have to reverse course on initiatives that are losing money, like our child care centers. I'm sure that you noted that detail in the video. Montgomery College is not the only institution that's had to face some very difficult decisions about many areas of the institution, and that was a hard one. Uh, I want to point out that Mohawk talks about saving $200,000 a year by closing their child care center. The college will save several times more than that amount with the reduction of our child care centers. And we've been working diligently to help our employees find other positions, and that process will not be concluded until May 30th, which is the last day that employees will have to choose upon several options. And while on this subject, I would be remiss if I didn't also talk about our uh, former bookstore employees who are transitioning within the organization as well. Follett has already hired six former Montgomery College bookstore employees into its ranks. It's total, in total, 15, 15 employees have found new jobs either within the college, with Follett, or outside the college. 13 of our employees accepted an early retirement package or a voluntary separation package. So I know for a fact these are very difficult things to have to decide. And if someone has to make the decisions, I think a lot about them and I pray about them and I talk to people about them. But I think the college has really held itself to a high standard that benefits us in the long run. We've had to make some very difficult choices, but our goal has been to make sure that our employees have had a number of choices about their next steps and that they were supported in the process as we made these decisions. You may also have noticed that Mohawk raised their grant funding over four years from $800,000 to $5 million. Now this is an area in which Montgomery College has a strong track record but also a tremendous amount of growth potential. Last year's $15 million TAC grant, and because I'm a reader so I can make sure I say it right, Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training from the Department of Labor was a huge win for us as an institution, and we're poised to do even more in that realm. In fact, over the last five years, the college's grant funding from public source grants has almost tripled from just over $4 million to $11.5 million. Two new major grants this year are helping students advance in STEM. The National Science Foundation just awarded Montgomery College $1.2 million for a project called Next STEM, aimed at increasing the number of STEM teachers in the classroom. This is the first year that we are recruiting students under a separate NSF grant for $600,000 called Access Engineering and On-Ramp to STEM, designed to help low-income students succeed in STEM. And on the humanities side of the house, because I'm very sensitive to that, grants from places like the National Endowments for the uh, Humanities allow MC students and scholars in liberal arts to engage in research and collaboration with colleagues from around the world. Over spring break, in fact, 16 MC faculty, staff, and administrators traveled to Xi'an University, excuse me, Xi'an Providence, Province in China, where the college's Global Humanities Institute has enjoyed a productive academic partnership since 2013. Another area of growth is our use of data analytics. I'm sure that you notice our counterparts at these three colleges in the videos have been using data to see their organization differently and to be more clear and efficient in their decisions. Now, we're no stranger to data at Montgomery College, but how we use that data needs to be enhanced. Institutions that rely effectively on data have access to it in real time, 
shared widely across the divisions and across platforms, and have it presented in actionable ways. So instead of looking at a spreadsheet with hundreds of numbers and columns and all kinds of stuff that y'all put in the spreadsheets, they're looking at infographics that has the numbers built into a visual that immediately conveys critical information. And now that we are officially members of the Achieving the Dream Network, we will be assigned our own data coach who is going to help us understand what tools are out there and how they can help us glean insights into our processes here at Montgomery College. And I'll give you one other concrete example. I just gave a talk last month at the National Association of Academic Advisors, better known as NACADA, uh, their Mid-Atlantic Region meeting. And there's a lot of buzz in the room about how software can help students predict when students need to be redirected in their academic planning. The software can also accurately predict what kinds of support that they're going to need, often before they even know that they need it. This has the potential to create much greater efficiencies in advising, which just about every research study on completion says is critical to the success of students. Predictive analytics can be very empowering if you look at how many people use them on a daily basis. So let me, let me share, how many of you have on a Fitbit, Apple Watch, some other, I call them personal fitness devices. Anybody, how many, show your hands, right? So I have, my, I have an Apple Watch, personally. It's been buzzing up a storm. I've, I've gotten a lot of credit for standing over the last hour, uh, but, it, but it has told me I'm not moving a lot, right? I'm standing still. Um, and it gives me feedback every day, every hour. It's telling me something about how I am progressing in my own fitness goals. Drink a cup of water, stand up, take a walk, get up and exercise. Um, how many of you order things on Amazon or online retailer? Okay, love me some Amazon. Um, have you noticed that they sometimes send you messages about products that are closely related to categories of things that you've bought before? I also think they know when payday is, personally. <laughs> There's something about that. They know when the payday is, and they send you these messages, and it's all, you brought this blue sweater, and here's another sweater that looks just like that. Or here's this cologne that you purchased, and I think that it has a similar smell. And here are 15 books that look just like the one you just bought, right? And bing, bye, 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 all right? That's data analytics at work. And there's an array of higher education products that accomplishes the same dynamic for students. They analyze patterns of previous students and can predict with pretty good accuracy when a student might need a tutor because they scored low on a benchmark quiz or when they need to see an advisor uh, because they've hit a certain number of credits without declaring a major. These analytics can help the college to help students be more successful while they are here with us. So choices about technology are going to be an increasing part of our strategic toolkit for cutting, that was at me, for cost cutting, and by extension, for student success. We sometimes forget how many pathways students have to navigate while they're here, from course scheduling and degree planning to transfer support and career guidance. Different students also have to steer through financial aid, developmental education, academic tutoring. Many of them are just trying to figure out life. If there's a way to help them do that, we should be doing that. All of the, these involve people and processes that can be more efficiently and effectively organized so that students get the quality time they need with people, right? So we can put some of the other stuff where they have to do it on a computer screen or on a device but when they want to sit down with somebody, we don't have to worry about that having already been done. Just about every department and division has the potential for improvement by using new technology and looking at data analytics that describe their work. For example, a student could visualize how a change in a course schedule could impact cost or time to completion. An administrator could determine what is working well or where changes are needed to better support a student in his or her way to achieving their promise. 
a faculty or staff member can identify an opportunity to re-engage a student simply by looking at their advising profile. All of these things contribute to student success. What I told this group of 400 advisors at the Nakata conference last month was that technology is not going to take away your job, but technology is going to change it. It's going to allow you to have more time to have those conversations with students that a computer algorithm simply cannot do. Talking to students about why they're stumbling, what their challenges are, and why they're stumbling with their academic plan is a job that a machine simply can't do. Technology can tell us what courses a student hasn't registered for, when she should have, but not why he didn't do that. And that's where the heart of advising is so essential in the why conversations. If our counselors and our advisors are spending more of their time in those types of conversations of relevance with students because we purchase new software to assist them, that is spending for success. If people across the campuses and divisions are able to look at current student data on enrollment and progress in real time and have productive conversations about efficiencies, that's spending for success. Now with all of these talks of efficiencies, I'm going to bring this to a close by doing a couple of things, talking about analytics. You may be wondering, are we still going to spend on people? It's probably going through some of your head, if not in here, out there. As I've said before, faculty and staff are our most vital asset in, as an institution. People are over 80% of the college's operating budget. And remember the quote by James Frick, show me where you are spending and I'll show you what you value. We value people at Montgomery College. We want to multiply their value with technology. We have to search out efficiencies to work, to work processes. And in other words, we have to simply spend smarter. We have to maximize the impact of every dollar we spend. We owe it to our county and to our state for their investments in us as an institution. We owe it to ourselves as college employees to find the processes that multiply the effects that we're putting in on behalf of our students. And most of all, we owe it to our students. We simply, that's why we're here. It's not about us, it's about them. Because they're trusting us with their time and their energy and oftentimes their hope about their future. We have to be thoughtful about that. Now, I'll also share with you, though, that we're making progress as an institution. Remember that scorecard that I introduced last year this time? Let me talk to you a little bit about that. We just finished updating this uh, for this year, and there's some real successes that I think we need to give ourselves a pat on the back for. Our spring retention is up from 71% to 81% as an institution. That's huge. That's huge. Fall retention is also up, not quite as much, but it's still a dramatic uh, increase. Our transfer rates are up as well, which I think speaks to the quality of our advising and the diligence of our faculty. Now the complete scorecard will be up next week, and you'll see that we still have some work to do with completion, and there's a whole uh, thing that I'm writing about this in terms of our cohort data. While we called out this retention data is that it talks to the things we've done immediately. When you look at spring to spring, that's within one year. Our cohort data goes back several years. So the impact of the changes we're taking will take longer to manifest within that cohort. But I'm excited that we're holding steady in a lot of areas and we're seeing growth in others. And I challenge you to be very thoughtful about that when our communication comes out uh, later on. I want to point out one more thing about the scorecard because it's an example of how metrics can really help accountability. You notice that we've made progress in certain measures and we haven't progressed in other areas. Going back though to the numbers at regular intervals is what helps us to reflect upon the processes underlying our work 
as an institution, if it, it forces us to ask a simple question, how can we get better outcomes? How can we influence these outcomes? That's something that we all can ask ourselves, and we appreciate even more how smart spending is tied to student success. I think of this spending for success model in terms of concentric circles. We all start by looking at the nature of our own work and our increasing uh, skills or training, wherever it needs to be to gain efficiencies. Then you start to look at spending patterns and workflow data in your departments or your divisions to see where you can make improvements that save resources. And on a college-wide scale, everyone in this room and everyone who's looking at us virtually can contribute to the savings by proposing an idea to the Blue Ribbon Task Force on spending for success. It could be your insight, your thought, this little germ of an idea that you have in your head that can help us save and help us implement a new type of technology or a new workflow process that can improve the organization. And you don't have to have all the ideas worked out. You can have something in the back of your head, just some insight, and we'll help you think it through. And a group of folks are going to be taking the time to do that. Finally, there are grants from outside the college that can help us substantially as an organization. I mentioned a few of them earlier that help support hundreds of students through scholarships, but not every grant has to be a million dollar grant. It's nice, but they don't have to be everyone. Each grant that supports student success is making a difference. So example of this is in January, three students from our Boys to Men program went on a study abroad program to Ethiopia using grant funds. And while the total sum was only $5,000, their advisor told me that for students who have never traveled outside of the US, one who had never been on a plane, that trip was life defining for them. That is student success. After all, that's what we're about at Montgomery College. We're about changing students' lives, and that means spending our funds more strategically and spending our energies more productively. Smarter spending all around will help our students reach their goals, which is really at the heart of our mission. When we do this collaboratively, and with a focus on student success, I feel confident that we will be spending for success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pollard. And as promised, we have time set aside for questions, both here in the room and online, if you're watching online, again, you can email your question to stateofthecollege at montgomerycollege.edu, or you can tweet it to at montgomerycoll using the hashtag SOTC2016. And we're gonna start with an online question. Oh boy. And it goes to one of the main themes of your uh, presentation. Who is going to be on the Blue Ribbon Task Force? That, you know, I could have predicted that would be the first question, right? Yes. So I don't know that yet. Uh, I'm going to look at doing a couple things. I want to uh, put some people on it by virtue of position. I think there's some people who have an intricate knowledge of the college's budget and processes that need to be on it. And then I also will obviously ask to have it populated uh, via our governance system to have some people on there. And then I'm also going to ask people to volunteer. I think one of the things that's very interesting to me is that sometimes we tend to go to the same people to do the same thing all the time, and then we're surprised when we get the same outcomes all the time. So I, I think it's important to have a combination of things, people who are intimately knowledgeable of the process, people who have different ways of thinking and knowing, people who are leaders within the organization who have been represented by their peers to be there. So it's going to be a nice little comp fab, and I might even get some people from outside the college. Uh, to serve on it, who can bring a perspective that, to be quite frank, many of us uh, may not always know because we are very closely related to the processes that we know within the college. Great question. I'll be making that decision probably uh, by the end of the month. That's fair, right? All right. 
All right, while we're uh, waiting for the folks in here to gear up with some questions, I have another online question. Okay. Um, are we still going to, given the budget uh, difficulties, are we still going to invest in programs like ACEs and achieving the promise, or will we have to cut them? So I, I think my whole intention of the speech in a lot of ways is to talk about how we redirect appropriate resources. Uh, we have outcomes uh, that are very important. If you look at achieving, look at our ACES program, uh, the data from the first set of students who are going to be completing uh, Montgomery College this year is compelling. Uh, the, these students who come to us oftentimes uh, with very fragile academic backgrounds are outperforming our students in terms of GPA, they're being retained at a higher level, they're persisting more thoughtfully, and they're moving through developmental education more swiftly. So for me, I need to have like five more million dollars to put into ACES because we need to have ACES not only at every high school in Montgomery County, but we need to have more students enrolled in Montgomery in the ACES program. So that, that's the first thing I think is critical to know about that. The Achieving the Promise Academy, uh, we're deeply invested in this because for me it's not only just a matter of student success, it's an issue of justice. I don't understand how an organization of our diversity, our size, and our scope would have articulated different expectations for students of color and students who come from backgrounds that have, they have to work di very diligently at once they come here to overcome. Why would we not as an organization with our mission be invested in that? So that is not a place where I would be looking to say, oh, here are resources to, to, to redirect. Now Dr. Warmack, Mr. Preston, and all the folks are going to come to me and say, okay, Darian, here are the things you say that we have to do. This is what you told the board you're going to want to be doing. This is what the board says is critical for us to be doing. Where are you going to take the other money from? And those are the conversations that we're going to be having through the task force and through other And here's the beautiful part about this. Y'all have already been doing this, though. So when we prepared the budget for this year, how much did we cut before we even brought it to the board? 2.5 million before we even brought it forward. So you all, and that was simple and simple conversations. Bob sitting down and having a conversation, somebody else having a conversation. We've noticed you've kind of left this here. One of my favorite conversations he told me about was, you have this amount of money, you've never spent this. Perhaps you don't need it. And that's an easy give back, isn't it? That's, that's an easy way to be able to say, thoughtfully as an organization, let me begin to say, this may be something we can redirect to an aim that's going to advance student success. So we're quite excited about this. Um, I don't think the place I want to start is with cuts. Where I want to start is how do we gain efficiencies and how do we think differently about how we do our work. Great question, though. All right, we have a question from uh, the audience. Certainly. If you could stand, please. Hello. I would like you to consider adding a student onto your Blue Ribbon Task Force hmm. because only they can speak to the challenges that they're facing. I completely agree. I, I actually think we need to have more students and more spaces. Uh, sometimes it's amazing to me that we could go through, I can say in my whole day, sometimes a whole week, talking about the issues of the college, the county, and the state, and the word student never comes up. So I do think it's critical to have student voices because uh, it's much better to have someone speak for themselves than to have someone else trying to speak for them. Great, great points. Okay, we're going to uh, take another online question. All right. Um, are those colleges in the videos really similar to Montgomery College? Are their solutions relevant to MC? So I, I certainly think they are. They certainly may not have the same demography. They may not have the same size. They may have some different context. Uh, but if that's the focus, I think you're missing the point. And, and the point of this is to demonstrate that this is a conversation that many organizations across the country are having. So uh, there are very few colleges that look like Montgomery College. Uh, there are very few places that look like Montgomery County. So if you're expecting me to have examples that do that, that's probably not going to be the case. But the takeaway from these examples that I'm showing you is that there's a context in the broader space of higher education and in community colleges where people are having these conversations and they are addressing very real and significant issues that we may not have yet to address. And one of the beautiful parts about this is that we can see how someone else is doing it with the hope that maybe down the line, if we have to face that, we have examples that we can draw from. I also think that there were some parallels. So they may not look exactly like Montgomery College, but there are a number of things. They talked about decreased budgets. They talked about changing enrollment. 
They've talked about challenges and grant opportunities. So there are lots of things that are very similar, but they are not exactly like Montgomery College, but I would offer that they're relevant and that they speak to something uh, much bigger than that particular institution. It's a part of, if I can, the English teacher in me. It's a narrative I'm trying to create here, uh, not just a set of examples. All right, we have an online question here, and we're gonna read it right off sure. the laptop. Uh, this is from David Phillips. Uh, data is great, but some programs with great value to humanity, such as the arts, theater, music, dance, and art, are more expensive than others. Sure. MC has an enviable, enviably strong arts culture and tradition. Is there a commitment to them going forward? So uh, one is that um, I would offer there are a number of programs that are very expensive that have a, a, a commitment and a, a value. I look at our nursing program on the Tacoma Park uh, campus is one of our most expensive programs, right? Yes, it's one of our most expensive, but it also provides one of the most significant resources to our community. So one of the things that I reject, and it's, it's a very easy place to go to, so y'all stay with me on this, right? Life isn't about either or. So I'm not saying that we're going to have, uh, we do these things, we're not going to do these things. At the same time, though, we have to ask something, and I'm an English major, I'm a humanist, I get that. I, I probably have more credits of humanities in my background that I could have graduated a year earlier if I hadn't done that, right? But here's the reality about this, though, is that we have to ask the hard questions, and we can't privilege the fact that these things advance a history or support a history of the college, or we can't begin to hold sacred this idea that these things are so special that we can't ask questions about them. So the same questions that I'm going to be asking, uh, matter of fact, I know that nursing is already asking this question, how can we get our costs down some? They, I, we had a conversation about that the other day. It's the same question I'm going to be asking the arts and the humanities and all of those things. How do we sit down? Because it can't simply be said, let's just keep doing this because this is a strong tradition. I can't remember everything that David said in that. At the same time, we're going to also have to argue what our value is and find out other revenue sources that can help that. So I can't say, I think the last part of the question was, is there a commitment to them? Uh, we are a comprehensive community college. We deliver general education. We have general studies. There is a commitment to that. That does not mean that anything is sacred within the institution. There are going to be hard questions for everyone. So I watch. Uh, if I'm invited to a certain classes and I'm going to ask the same thing, I, I get to do that all the time. People say, hey, come in and ask. I'm going to ask a question. Why do we let this class go with six students enrolled? It's a question to be asked. Now, there could be very good reasons based on equipment, based on it's a sequence course. There's all kinds of things that could be asked in that question. But there's going to have to be the conversation. And we don't have the luxury of avoiding those conversations. All right, we have a question back here. Thank you. I would like to know with the one college concept that we have and the fact that we have outsourced our bookstores, are there other centralized operations that are on the budget plan? So I have not uh, discussed with the board or I have not discussed with the senior team any others at this point. What I do think is important is to assess what we have done and to make sure that they're working properly and that we re realize the benefits that we thought we would as an organization. Uh, but the other thing is that part of this Blue Ribbon Task Force might be a conversation that they have. Are there ways in which we can use contracted services in a much more thoughtful way? I don't have an answer to that um, directly to say that other than to say we have not discussed anymore. Um, but I don't think that kind of going to the last question, I don't think that anything is going to be sacred. I do think that there are going to be conversations that have to be had, and we have to make a decision as an organization as to whether or not we want to go down that pathway or not. Thank you for that. We have another question from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. Uh, I understand that there was an Achieving the Dream conference not too long ago, and the term data coach was an exciting one. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate um, on what was learned by the people who were able to attend the conference and if any of that is going to help inform some of the work of the Blue Ribbon, Ribbon Task Force. Yeah, thank you very much. I, uh, that's a really great question uh, for a couple of reasons. One, the Achieving the Dream conference was um, our first introduction as an institution um, significantly about what the Achieving the Dream uh, network is. And it really is a network of colleges, about 200, 230, that have come together and have a commitment around student equitable outcomes, ensuring that every student, regardless of background, ethnicity, gender, 
economic status, has equitable outcomes within their institutions, and that colleges challenge themselves to look at their culture, their practices, in such a way to produce those outcomes and to create that ecosystem. Part of that is they have built their network around two key principles. One is data, how you look at and confront your data as an institution and reckon that and not ignore it. And the other is how you choose to lead, both in terms of formal leadership and informal leadership within your organization. And they provide us two coaches who assist with that, a data coach and a leadership coach. And they both come in and they sit down and say, hmm, they ask for a, a, a certain profile. There's a set of questions that we have to put together and have to give them this data. And they're going to suggest to us, and I, based on the colleges that know who've done this, so here's something that's very obvious based on your data. Um, how have you addressed that? How are you as an organization thinking about this? Have you looked at these other parts that can affect that? Ah, here is a, a significant issue regarding X. As an institution, how are you coaching and leading yourself to the, toward different outcomes that create equitable so outcomes for all students? So I'm very excited about it because I think we have some excellent researchers here at the college. They, um, those of you who've spent time with they produce wonderful data about the institution. Um, what I will also tell you, though, as an institution, we don't always know how to process it. Um, and so you can get reams of data. You ask them, I, one of my best friends for a long time was a researcher, and I, I never forget the first time I was at the College of Lake County, I called her, I said, Nancy, I said, I'd like to know the college's retention rate. And I was the chief academic officer, and I was doing a grant, and she said, and, and those of you ever talked to researchers, they kind of start this way. Well, help me know, uh, she said, what is it you really want to know, dear? <laughs> and probably about 15 minutes later, she had coached me through a conversation to kind of narrow, because the college, well, the college's retention rate is going to differ, are you saying per term, per semester? Are you looking for a particular group of students? Are you think, I mean, she kind of, and I was like, oh my lord, right? <laughs> but it taught me very quickly about the precision of questions, right? And then the willingness as an institution then to grapple with that data when it comes out. So that's what the research coach would do, the leadership coach would do the same thing. And then we also become a part of a broader community where we come together. A lot of the best practices now that are coming about student success came from achieving the dream. This idea of uh, students don't do mandatory, uh, this idea of on-time registration, this idea of mandatory advising, all of this started with the precursors of colleges who were involved in achieving the dream probably seven to eight years ago. And they became best practices that many colleges have simply adopted based on looking at their own data, but then also understanding what those best practices are. Thank you for the question. All right, another online question here. Sure. This is from uh, Ramon de la Cruz. Uh, looking to the future, we should be diligent that reliance on predictive analytics doesn't become a, in quotes, minority report. Mm that stereotypes students based on data and not relationships. I, I, think, I think you're very thoughtful response. I think um, data has a lot of power, right? Uh, how you choose to, actually, let me rephrase that. Data has no power. Data is just your, is your truth, right? It's a reflection of who you are. The power comes in is how you choose to use that and how you choose to interpret it. Um, and I would offer to you, it's kind of the same thing. We, we do our PAR report each year, and the college had developed a, a set of um, established outcomes that we expected for different minority groups. And I think probably my first or second year here, I asked, well, why do we have different expectations for Hispanic or Latino students and African Americans than we do for white and Asians? Why, and so much lower. Now, the data the, and the response to me was based on the outcomes thus far. And we're so I said, but shouldn't we as an institution have the same aspirational intent based on what we do for all populations of students? Now, there's some research issues in there, right? Because the researchers all told me, that's not quite right. Let's have, and we work through this. But I think this is a, a very thoughtful question that Ramon is asking to me. is about intent and it's about use. Data lets us know who we are. Our question is, do we have the courage to do it and to deal with that? And we also not use it to say, oh, these students come into the door with these sets of things. They look this way. Therefore, uh, they're not going to be successful. Therefore, we aren't going to invest resources in them. I would say our intent is completely different. These students come into the door. We know these things about them. We know that this is how students are successful. How do we put interventions in there right quick to get them started? So that um, 
to me is a difference in intent, Ramon. But thank you for the question. We have a question from the audience. Thank you. Good, uh, good afternoon, Dr. Pollard. It is afternoon. Yes. Um, I have two roles at the college. One of them is uh, part-time faculty at Tacoma Park. And I wanted to bring up the issue of scheduling and scheduling classes. Um, I'm teaching two classes this semester. One of them is a Thursday night class, and one of them is a compressed schedule late start class mm -hmm. that is held on Monday and Wednesdays. And I thought when the department asked me to teach the class at the particular time, I thought, sure, I'll do that. No way will 10 students come to learn six hours worth of political science in a semester. This is not going to happen. So I will look like, hey, I'm flexible. I'm new in the department, and I'm happy to teach anything at any time. And this class will not come to fruition. I had 32 students sign up for the class. This was a class that met from 4.30 to 7.30 on Monday and Wednesday. Now my other class on Thursday night meets from 6.30 to 9.10, and I have 15 students that I had to sort of muster up, if you will. I did nothing for this Monday, Wednesday compressed schedule class, late start class. And to me, that, I, you know, with this little itty bitty experience that I have demonstrates that there might be a greater need for students to have these compressed classes at times that are different and maybe not as convenient um, as we're used to. And so I don't know if you want to comment on maybe what we're doing about trying to make a more flexible schedule for our students, certainly towards the goal of student success. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll say a couple of things and I welcome other people to chime in. First of all, I think wouldn't this be a great semester to be in a political science class? I just want to tell you. <laughs> Because I, I'm, I'm about fit to be done with the politics, <laughs> so I would need a place to work it out, and that would be a great opportunity to do that. Because people in my office are getting sick of me walking in and saying, did you see such and such? Because I'm wound up all the time. So uh, I'm envious of you teaching a political science class this semester. I, I, your point uh, is exactly what our data coach uh, will be asking us to look at. Um, because they're asking us, if, if you look at uh, enrollment patterns, if you look at student success, if you look at what students choose to do, um, are you as an institution designing a schedule that's responsive to those students or are you designing a schedule that is convenient for you as an organization and the people that teach the classes, right? Now I can say this, I'll freely admit, when I taught, I worked hard to have a schedule where I taught, uh, I never wanted to teach a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, the 50 minutes, because I didn't think that I was the best teacher. I wanted to teach hour, was 90 minutes, hour, yeah, hour, what is it, hour and 15 minutes, right? So I wanted to teach hour, because I thought that was the best for me. So we, as an English department, when I was at College of Lake County, we'd sit in a room, be about this many of us, English full-time faculty, and we'd sit down and we'd plan out the schedule, and we changed quite a few of them all the time. Now, we may not do this here at Montgomery College, but we did it there. Well, that was a 9 to, 9 to 9.50, so I'm going to make that 9 to 10.15, and we'll put it here and here. And then guess what happened? Not only did we take off some of the options, because we didn't coordinate that with what was happening with the students' other part of the schedule, and then we took a classroom and blocked it out for two hours. Right? And I, we don't do that here, I'm sure. No. But we did it at the College of Lake County when I was there. And as an English faculty member, I was able to say, because this was the best way in which I thought I taught, Clearly, students like this methodology as well because they did it on Tuesday and Thursdays. Why don't they do it on Monday and Wednesdays, right? There was something wrong with that, and I can say that now. I, I know I was being selfish. I was being selfish because it helped me based on my, what I thought was my teaching strength. It also helped me in other areas of my life. So I, I think there's a very thoughtful conversation that we have to have, and that's where the data comes in. So if you look at enrollment, we look at late start classes. We know students enjoy late start classes for lots of different reasons. Um, we know that uh, how we look at the schedule. One, I sat with a group of deans not too long ago. Probably the number one thing they talked about was the schedule and how we need to sit down and grapple with the schedule. So I, I think your point illustrates if we actually pay attention to the data and if we also pay attention. I, one of the things we're doing with this software we're going to be looking at um, I'm always struck 
that we don't have more data about what students need or their expectations are. So if you have a student through a, a, soft, a piece of technology that's allowed them to kind of plan out the net, their four or five semesters at the college or three, or three and a half years, and they know I'm a part-time student, I want to take these courses, I want to graduate at this time, and I'm able to, this is my plan over the next several semesters I'm going to do. Here's analytics and big data. If I can pull that out of this system and give it to the deans and department chairs who are scheduling and realize, wow, Carla and 1,500 Carlas are planning to do X, Y, or Z, perhaps I should be designing a schedule that's responsive to that. Because if we start with Carla as a student and don't start with Darian, the instructor, and don't start with the pre-established schedule that we just roll over, because that's what we used to call it at the College of County, we would roll it over. We don't do that here, right? Okay? So we would call it to roll over the schedule, and all of a sudden we just kind of plot the things back in there. That didn't require us to do a lot of work. So I think that that's, your, your point illustrates exactly what big data is about and about using that data to advance Carlos. Lots of Carlos. We like Carla, so we want to have lots of Carla's. We have a, a question and a or a comment here in the front row. Uh-oh, that's one of my bosses. <laughs> um, I want to commend you on your, uh, your presentation for State College. You had a bunch of things in there I love in, in regards to uh, predictive analytics and business. Um, but if you will, and I'm going to go off script for a second, which you love when I do this, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm going to ask I a couple questions. I can't control this. I'm freaking okay. out. I'm freaking yeah. out. No. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. How many people in this room have smartphones? Got two. Okay. How, how many in this room have kids or grandkids? Raise your hand. See, everybody here thinks that this device is a smart apps device, but it's actually a child suppression device. <laughs> okay? Because typically, when you have a, a young child that needs to be quieted in your busy place, what do you do? Get in the phone. So we're dealing with a whole generation of young men and women that have been raised in that capacity. So we're dealing with a digitally native, very smart group. And although I commend you looking at the business side of how we, we bring better resources to bear for our students, we're dealing with a whole different generation of students. And I, I wanted to see if you could comment a little bit about how we're going to address the changes in, in education. I, I think you're right on, uh, 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 Mr. Pretty, and for a couple of reasons. I, I've shared this actually at the opening meeting. So it is freaking me out that my son has no books. Now, as someone who took great pride, Chicago public school system, books would come home. We used to wrap them in a brown paper bag, <laughs> write your name on them. You know, you didn't write in the book so it could be used for I mean, and I would, you could show your book to, and that my father would know that I was studying because he could see where I had highlighted when I got to do that eventually. So I take, I still have most of my books from my undergraduate major sitting at home in my library because I love books, right? I love. Amazon, my best friend, love me some books, right? Here's a problem though, this kid comes home with this big old backpack every day, hamburger backpack, on his back. You know what's in his backpack? Trash. <laughs> he don't even have a binder. He has one little folder and he has a couple pieces of paper and all these letters that his friends, they write back and Pokemon people that they do, right? So here's the thing, he's third grade and MCPS, doesn't use textbooks, does his homework on Google um, Classroom, right? I had to take a class on that, George. I know you got one. I got to take a class on Google Classroom because the kid, so I, it has messed my world up. And as a parent, I'm struggling with that. So I keep thinking, Miles, though, in a few years, it'd be in Montgomery College. Here's the other little secret about that. Miles is in third grade, but James is in ninth grade. Same thing. He's going to be here sooner than Miles. So we as an organization, this is exactly the whole question about open educational resources, how we think about that, how we design pedagogies around that. And the, the biggest part of that is the professional development that we have to do that we're doing through leading others about how you teach, understanding the student population, how you teach them, how you redesign curriculum, because I don't want everybody else freaking out the way I'm freaking out about what's happening. And if I had to teach these folks when they come in, 
Jesus be a fence, right? Thank you, Dr. Pollard. Uh, sorry we are out of time. It was a great discussion. Oh, man, that snuck up on me. Sorry. I got on behalf up. of Dr. Pollard and everyone at Montgomery College Television, we want to thank you for joining us for the 2016 State of the College Address. Now, a video of today's presentation will be posted online. It'll be available at montgomerycollege.edu slash stateofthecollege for later viewing.